I got married in 2012. We moved into our first house. It wasn't per se old. It fits the homes in the neighborhood. Nevertheless, from the first night I spent there, I could sense something wasn't right. Choosing to watch the lovely Molly that first night didn't help either. I just always had an eerie feeling like something or someone was near me. At night, I began to hear footsteps in my wife's makeup room. I'd sometimes go upstairs to see why she was pacing for so long and always found her asleep in bed. At one point, I entered the makeup room late at night. A black crayon we didn't even own rolled across the floor room, some dark corner of the room. The corner that was always darker than the rest and the one I felt my eyes coming from. Fast forward one month. A bunch of friends were over for my wife's friend's birthday. We watched a scary movie in the dark. After we shut off all the lights, TV, everything, and my ex started talking about how I thought the place was haunted and how she believed it to be bullshit. Just at that moment, directly behind a friend, a frame, propped up picture of us all fell forward onto the table. Not fell, but more like angrily slapped. Everyone shrieked. And then we all laughed. I laughed too, but more so to give off the impression that I wasn't scared. We got married and moved into our house in September 2012. In October, I started having what I thought were strokes. At the time, I was using a supplement, which contained something called 1,3-dimethylamine hydrochloride. Basically, a fancy way to say meth, without the FDA breathing down their necks. It was called Jack3D. I'm sure many of you exercise freaks remember it. The doctors figured out that my problem and told me to stop, so I did. The panic attacks persisted. I went to the ER 11 times and saw seven cardiologists. Funny thing is, these attacks only occurred in that house. It got to a point where even my ex would say, you know, I'll be having a great day, but as soon as I walk in this house, I feel horrible. I took that as maybe she was just feeding off of my negativity, but I agreed. Something in there wasn't happy with us. We shouldn't have been there. The rest is short and concise. It had been months, maybe four. Things would fall off the wall. We had a plate attached to some hooks in the wall, which said something about how a home is only a home with love or some hallmark bullshit. It was thrown halfway across the room. It shattered. We'd come home to find pictures all over the floors. Toilet paper unraveled. Her explanation of this was that our four pound teacup Pomeranian did it. No way she stood on this fucking hind legs for a minute straight and unraveled a roll of toilet paper that was way too high up from anyway. And those footsteps, those incessant footsteps, never ending. The most horrifying moments was in late winter. My puppy was in my lap and something caused him to stand at attention. His muscles were tense and solid as concrete. Unmoving, tail pointed to the ceiling. I heard the footsteps again, only this night, they were especially active. I felt that the sanctity of our house was truly threatened. Henry growled, just as the steps moved from the room through the hallway, and then down the stairs into the living room. I didn't even try to look. I grabbed Henry and we ran out of the front door and just watched the monolithic bricked entity leer down at me with those foreboding second story windows as eyes and a yawning, a gassed mouth for a door. Desperation. The basement was the worst part of the house. We were both terrified of it, and she would never go down there without me. Finally, we got what we were waiting for. Irrefutable proof before both of our eyes that something not of this earth was with us, and that we needed to leave. Her stepdad and mum came over. My stepdad-in-law sat on the couch watching football. They were in the kitchen. We had a hanging plant in the dining room. Mind you, as this was all occurring, we had the front door open, so some air could get in through the glass screen door. So, she's chatting with her mom about whatever. Suddenly, the flower pot began swinging. I mean swinging. Very forceful. I swear, even the wind from a horrible thunderstorm couldn't have gotten it to do this. My ex yelled out my name. I walked in and watched. Back and forth. Back and forth. Something was pushing it. Finally, her mother had enough, and being the tough woman she was, she was a captain at a jail after all. She screamed, whoever you are, 
You need to leave this house. It no longer belongs to you. The swinging slowly halted to a stop. When I turned around, the front door was slowly shutting on its own. No breeze, no wind. It didn't shut all the way, but just that creaky sound is enough to give anyone the heebie-jeebies. Within a few weeks, things started to get better, happier, but it didn't stay that way. It started all over again, only much fiercer and uglier. The moment that made us consider really moving again was one night in the kitchen. We were making something, and suddenly there was knocking on the wall. No joke, I have no other way to put it. Literal knocking. Not hard or angry, very quaint, like a Jehovah's Witness. It scared us so much, I almost spilled a pan full of burning grease all over me. The negativity came back. The footsteps came back. And that basement was akin to walking into a rung of hell. We moved out after a year. I drove past that house a few times later on after we'd left. Didn't notice anything, except once. I slowly crept by and pulled over in front one evening. It wasn't light or dark, almost dusk. I was staring at something in the living room window, curtains perhaps. Something caught my eye. Then, one of the curtains brushed to the side, and I saw a face. My heart skipped, and I was frozen. I actually jumped in my seat. No lights on inside. This is no bullshit. I looked closely. It may sound funny now, but it wasn't then. It looked like someone who was in the Revolutionary War. The entity had white hair, like an old powdered wig, a painting from the 18th century. Just like the wig that Washington has on in all of his portraits. It looks at me still, very, very still and rigid. I couldn't make out much of the face, nor the eyes, which looked like li little black buttons. Its expression was very droll, like the way your white-haired grandmother would give a child the death stare for stealing out of the cookie jar. Kind of like, you do that again, you're in for it. Eerily, it gave me a look like it recognized me and like it was telling me, you don't come near this house. I put the car in drive and we watched each other as I drove away, away from a house with no cars in the driveway and a for sale sign on the lawn. I went home and told her. She said I was lying. That was until three years later, her cousin's friend who lived on that very street aptly named Washington Avenue, told her that people would frequent that home and move out quickly. She never connected the dots. She said it was because there were projects not far down the road. I knew otherwise. All these years later, it spooks the hell out of me that we were in that thing I saw the entire time. Why didn't it show itself to me before? Had I seen it? Had either of us seen it prior to moving in? We wouldn't have. To this day, that year was one of the most powerful, disturbing points of my life. I'd also like to note that in that house I grew up in, which is the place my dad died in, I literally saw his ghost sitting in his favourite living room chair in the middle of the night. I'd never been so scared. This experience dwarfed that beyond all recognition. There's a man that lives in a duplex at the top of my street, five houses down from me. He's very strange, always in his front yard yelling, sometimes seemingly at no one. He's very wild looking, just gives me a bad vibe. But before the encounter I'm going to describe, I wouldn't say I had any reason to be freaked out by him, just to take a note. Like I said, he lives at the top of the street, which is off a busy main road in my town. Across from his duplex is a big, empty double lot that we called the Glade. It's owned by the city and maintained well. It's a nice grassy place for me to take my dog to walk. I've been walking my dog there for about five years, no issues. It's perfect. There's an old shed and some signs that a house used to be on the lot, but mostly it's just trees and bushes and grass. I noticed a few times it seemed like someone was trying to block up the pathway onto the lot but thought maybe it was just people who maintain the lot, dumping the cuttings and stuff. So one morning, a few months back, I'm walking my dog before work, and I notice the odd neighbour is just staring at us from his stoop. 
I don't think he knew I could see him. And there's lots of bushes and stuff around the lot. He's just staring at us so intently. And I get kind of creeped out. But it's daytime and the busy street is right behind us. So I ignore him. And let my dog finish. And we walk home. A few days later, same thing. I'm walking my dog and I catch him intently watching us. This time, as I walk out the lot and head towards my house, the guy starts to follow us. He's maybe 20 feet behind us, but he's keeping pace. My dog starts freaking out and I kind of half turn and say, good morning, but he doesn't answer. Just stares ahead and follows us all the way to my house. I turn down my driveway, trying to be casual, but my dog is just losing her mind. She's got her hackles raised and she's pulling and growling. He doesn't follow me up the drive, thankfully. I turn back as luck. As we get in the house and the guy has just walked about halfway past my house, just turns around and goes back to his house. He never even acknowledged me, but it was more creepy than I can describe. I still don't know what he was doing or why he didn't want me in that lot. Was he planning something and my dog changed his mind? Was he trying to scare me away from the lot? I can't imagine he's got anything hidden on it, as the city keeps it well maintained. Or is he just crazy? He still lives there, but I don't walk my dog that way anymore. My husband works nights, so it still creeps me out. Luckily, my dog is super protective, and we have an alarm system. So, this story happened around 10 years ago, when I was still a university student and a pretty naive girl. I had a late class and after that, I hung out with my friends for a while. Soon, I started feeling sleepy, so I decided to walk home. Being very socially awkward, I tried to avoid the main streets because it was full of people, so last minute I took a different route from the usual one. As I made my turn to the left, I got an overwhelmingly eerie feeling in my gut. I brushed it off since I was walking in a familiar neighborhood not too far from where I lived. As I was thinking that, I noticed the shadow of a tall man behind me. My first instinct was to change course, but I didn't want to be judged as weird. Trust me, I know now. Also, another guy further down the road was walking the same direction as me. The shadow behind me kept growing as he was coming closer and his pace kept getting quicker and louder. My heart was beating like a drum. This went on for an uncomfortable amount of time, when suddenly, the step stopped. I decided I was going to turn around and look, but before I could react, I felt a strong shove from behind. As I stood there frozen in shock, the man sprinted past me. The other guy who was walking in the distance turned around, came to me and said, Hey girl, did that other guy bother you? That seemed suspicious since he wasn't even looking my way. How would you know? Nothing happened. I replied. My brain was screaming, danger. He started following me, saying things like, you look like you need my help, and we should get to know each other. Go away, I don't need you. Leave me alone, I said, trying to get this guy off my back. I was so scared and needed to think fast. My first thought was calling a guy to scare him off. My boyfriend at the time would always reply to my calls three hours late, at best, so reaching him was not an option. My best friend, I thought to myself, she'll answer for sure. As I called her, the guy started getting agitated. Hey, baby, when are you coming? I happily yelled. The guy sarcastically asked if my boyfriend was going to come to beat him up. I looked him dead in the eye and replied, he's going to beat the crap out of both of us when he gets here if you don't leave right now. I think that must have scared him because he started backing off. What made things even creepier was that he went the direction the tall guy ran towards. When he left, I ran home and cried. I didn't take that route for a long time. I feel like this was all choreographed against me, but I was lucky enough to overcome. If it was later in the night though, I just moved into a terrace house somewhere in Ghent, Belgium. I worked in a bakery then, so most of the time I would leave the house around quarter past five in the morning. I usually take my bike, which I parked just in front of my front door. As I was preparing to leave, I left my door slightly ajar, just in case I forgot something. 
I saw a man walking towards my direction. I thought, how strange. This guy's walking around the neighborhood with a cup of coffee in his hand at this hour. He stopped next to me, invading my space. He then greeted me and started asking me questions while giving me this horny, longing look. He kept edging closer to me. He asked me if I was living alone, if I was married or had children, how many of us are living in the house, if I had just moved in. I kept avoiding his questions. I could sense he was onto something bad. My mind was screaming danger. I quickly shut my front door so he couldn't shove me back in. I looked him straight in the eyes and calmly said, I know what you're thinking of doing. I recognize your face, so I can identify you easily. If you don't walk away right now, I will call the police. He looked embarrassed and walked away, with his head bowed down. I watched him until he disappeared in a corner. If I acted scared and small, he could have easily pushed me inside my house and raped me. I heard of this kind of incident happening. I'm glad I was quick enough to assess the situation and slammed my front door immediately. I didn't run inside my house to show him I am in control of the situation and not him. If I did, I'm sure he would have come back to try his luck again. I went to work shaking, but also relieved. I had to keep checking behind my back, of course, every time I leave the house early in the morning since then. I never saw him again after the incident. I was eight years old when my grandpa died. He'd had a heart attack and passed on Easter Sunday, morning that year. It was extremely hard on all of us because he was pretty young, in his late fifties, and it was fairly preventable. He was addicted to smoking cigarettes and it caused him to have a lot of issues with his heart. This stressed my mum out and made her smoke even more. She was 31, but had been smoking since she was a teenager. She had a heart attack less than two months after his death. I understand that her age may make it hard to believe, but she really did have a serious heart attack at that age. I only mention my mom's health here because it's important to why I'm not at home during this story. My sister and I stayed at my grandma's apartment while my mom was in the hospital. My dad wanted to be with her for obvious reasons and my uncle, my mom's brother, drove up so that he could be close by in case things got worse. We all slept over at my grandma's. My sister, six, and cousin, six, slept with my grandma in her bed. My uncle was still at the hospital with my dad, so I slept with my aunt in the living room. I was in the recliner and she took the couch. The recliner faced a very narrow hallway on the right side of the living room. There weren't any windows that could shine lights from outside in it. My aunt went to the bathroom at the end of the hallway and my grandma was with my sister and cousin in her room. So I was alone, watching Three's company in the living room. I happened to look down the hallway. On the end of the right side of the hall was my grandpa's old room. They slept in different rooms because he had a very loud CPAP machine. I swear on everything that he was there, walking down the hallway. I could only see him from his shoulders up but I knew that it was him. There wasn't any other light that could reach that angle. No cars passing by could have shone their light up that high and all the way to the back. The only window nearby was all the way to the left of the living room. I wasn't scared of him, but I was startled by seeing something come at me so unexpectedly. So little me screamed my head off and he disappeared. Grandma came fishing out of her room to see what had happened. I honestly don't remember if I told her that I saw him. I don't remember much of my night after that. I'd feel awful if I scared him away from me. My mom woke up from her surgery before my dad or anyone else was in the room with her. She says the first thing she remembers is my grandpa holding her hand and telling her that it was all going to be okay. She went back to sleep. When she woke back up, she wrote down the word dad followed by a question mark. She still had the tubes down her throat, so she couldn't actually speak. She wanted to see him. My father looked at the paper and had to remind her that he wasn't with us anymore. She just broke down into tears. I didn't know about this incident until earlier this year, and I never talk about the night I saw him walking down the hallway of his old apartment. I think he just wanted to check in on all of us to make sure that we were okay. 
I just wanted to ramble about this because it still makes me sad and I miss him very much. It's hard to format this into a true story mode because it does make me emotional, but I hope I did well enough. The anniversary of his death was a few weeks ago and this time of year always makes me think of the incidents. My mum's heart attack will have happened 15 years ago, this June. Maybe it was just an emotionally stressful time, or maybe we're both crazy. But I like to believe my eight-year-old brain. I like to think that it was real and not a child's hyperactive imagination. I like believing in my mom's experience with seeing him there so clearly holding her hand. He was the type to do that. It's a bit wild that the times we both saw him were so close to each other, but I guess that might make sense too if he had the chance to visit us one last time. After getting my driving license, I'm Italian, here you have to be 18. I was hanging out with my friends in Rome. There were five of us, me and four passengers. It was around midnight when we hopped off in a square in the south of the city with a football to play with. It was during summer vacations, so it was a normal thing for us. After some time, a guy in his early 30s came to us with a big travelling bag. He wasn't creepy, but he was strange. He was skinny, but very toned and athletic. Short trousers, very used sneakers, a long sleeve shirt, beard, greasy long hair and a baseball cap. Not a common look for an Italian 30 year old man. He started some chatting and then asked if he could join us playing. We were just passing the ball without it letting it touch the floor. After some minutes playing, he started to ask about our interests and then about our sex life. I'm a shy guy, but some of my friends aren't, so they started to go along with him, and he started to show us, without a reason, finger push-ups, one leg squats, and some other cool exercises. One of my friends was fooling him and treating him like a stupid person, always asking for more exercises. I forgot to say that he hid the big bag he had between two parked cars, one was mine, before he started playing with us. The friend of mine who was fooling around with him sent the ball a little bit far from us, and faking a fainting asked the guy to get the ball for us. Meanwhile, my friend asked me to unlock my car. He grabbed the man's bag and froze the bag inside the back of my car and invited me and my friends to hurry and go away with the guy's bag, leaving him with the ball. In a few seconds, we went away and he started chasing us running. But after some distance, he disappeared from my rear mirror. He was very fast though. I'm not a thief, but as a teen, we do stupid things, and I really didn't want to do something like this to a random guy. We went to a park near our houses, and my friends started opening the bag. And here, the thing started being creepy. If you don't know, in Italy, it's very, very, very uncommon. People are armed. We found dirty clothes, a knife, not a kitchen knife, but a dagger, some food, and a small box with three-digit locker. Now, we were so curious about it that we smashed it on the floor trying to open it. After some throws, the box revealed 16 female IDs, all different. I started to worry about my safety since we used my car and he could remember my license plates and maybe find me in some way. We also started to think who that man could be and why he carried these things. So we went to my friend's house, we switched cars and we went back with my friend's car to the place where we met the guy just to check. We arrived there and were hiding under the windows to make the car looking with only the driver inside. When we got there, more than one hour later, he was still there sitting on the car who was parked in front of mine. He didn't notice us and we went back home with a lot more doubts about him. After 10 years, I still remember this guy. The day after one of us went to the police with the bag saying that he found it in the road with the dagger and the IDs inside, he made an official report. Lying, but surely doing a good thing. This happened a couple of years ago, and while not the scariest situation, it was definitely creepy. I was on my way to work and decided to stop by the mall first to pick up some things I needed. As I was walking to my destination, I heard a voice behind me say, Hello Megan, how are you? I turned out expecting to see someone I knew, 
but I was surprised to see a tall man I've never seen before smiling at me. He said, hey Megan, again, and I sputtered a meek, aye, and kept walking. I thought maybe he said ma'am, and I just misheard it, so I, so I ignore it and keep walking to my destination. Once I get to the store, I notice he's still behind me and he enters the store with me. My gut is telling me this is not normal, but I try once more to give him the benefit of the doubt. I'm looking through a rack of clothes when I look up and see him looking around the store as if he was looking for someone. I'm 5'1", so I do well to hide in stores with racks and clothes, so I just grabbed what I wanted and walked to the front to pay. I looked up again and he was standing right by me and staring. The cashier and I shared awkward glances and I paid and walked out with this man right on my tail. So I got fed up and turned to him and said, what the hell do you want? He then said you and just walked away. So I walked to my car the whole time looking over my shoulder to make sure he wasn't nearby. And once I was inside my car, I pull out my phone to call my dad and notice I had a Facebook notification, which was a friend request from this stranger. I called my dad who said to check my Bluetooth or airdrop to see if it's on and it wasn't because I never use Bluetooth. I look out my car window and see this guy looking around the parking lot, looking in car windows. I tell my dad and he tells me to just go, so I did. I blocked the guy on Facebook and haven't heard or seen him from again. I hope I never do. I grew up in the small city of Penascola, Florida. It's a beautiful place known for white sand beaches and an island lifestyle. Since we didn't have much else to do besides the beach, the Pensacola Interstate Fair that would come every October was exciting for kids and adults alike. In October of 1996, my mom took me, my sister and I to the fair. I was 8 years old, my sister was 10. We rode all the rides and ate funnel cakes. My mom convinced us to go to a haunted house and I wasn't having it. My sister wanted to go on the ferris wheel, but I thought it was boring. So my mom said my sister could go and her and I would stay and watch. My sister went and while we were watching, the wheel stops. I asked mom what happened and she said she didn't know and went to ask. The carney told her it was just mechanical and they were sending someone up to fix it. Nothing made her. My mom and I stood there watching this man climb up the ferris wheel until he got to the top. I was bored looking around until I heard people scream. I looked just as this worker's body slammed onto the first metal rod at the top of the wheel and within one and a half seconds my mum grabbed my head and forced it into her stomach to prevent me from seeing the rest. My ears and her crying told me this man hit every rod down around 23 meters. The next thing I know my mum yells at me to go to a game nearby and don't move a muscle while she went to get my sister. I did but I was terrified. Eventually, my mum and my sister came back. My sister said she actually didn't see anything bad because she was at the top and saw he was going to slip and closed her eyes. Someone tried to grab his shirt, which ripped. I don't think I will ever get the image of that man dying. And to be honest, I don't even know his name. Between 2006 and 2010, I worked at Blockbuster. It was, to this day, the best job I've had. There was a program that I can't remember the name of, where you could choose between one or two DVDs that you could rent at once and keep for however long the exchange, then for one or two more continuously, paying a monthly price instead of by the movie. That deal would only be good for the particular store you signed up in, so we would get to know the people who were on these plans because they were always in the store. We had one regular couple named Patrick and his girlfriend. Can't remember her name. Patrick taught karate for kids and always came in wearing his karate outfit. They had kids with them, but I believe they were the girlfriends. He was one of our favorite regulars. He would always joke around and when we had game setups, rock band, guitar hero, call of duty, he and my coworkers would play when it wasn't busy. 
I'd say he was in the store once every two days for a year before he stopped coming in. I remember working the day he came in and told us he was moving to the next town over, so he was going to the blockbuster near his new home. I remember telling him how much we will miss seeing him and actually feeling sad. Well, one day in 2009, I went into work. And my co-workers were all in the back talking about a murder. It was a big news in my small town, I'm particularly sad as it was a couple that had fostered a lot of special needs kids and seemed nice. Well, apparently Patrick was the ringleader and shot the father. I saw pictures of him while he was being arrested and in court and got the chills. His happy smiling face that came in the store all those times was now cold and literally different. What made him look so stupid was his method. They all literally wore ninja suits like the ones he would wear in his karate classes. I can say I was a pretty brave or stupid teenager. I always came back home late, usually around midnight. I usually took the buses that go through a well-lit street near my house. But that night, because the bus I usually take had already left, I needed to go on a bus that stops near a forest. And it's kind of creepy and dark. My phone was dead, as usual. As soon as I got off the bus, I started walking home. And I noticed an old, homeless-looking man following me. After a couple of minutes of walking right beside me, he started asking if I was a university student, and I just told him no. At the time, I was 13 or 14 years old, and I didn't know how to react to this, and I answered his questions. He asked me then if I go to high school, and I told him no, I go to a middle school. At first, I thought he was maybe just going my way and not necessarily following me, and I felt nervous and a bit scared. He proceeded to talk about something I don't even remember, as I was only focused on being ready if he's dangerous. After a couple minutes of us walking, a car stops next to us. There's a woman in that car. She looks at me and asks if everything is all right. I said yes, scared of his reaction. But as he was looking at her, I shook my head to let her know that no, nothing was okay. He started yelling at her, how that's because he's Jewish and some other stuff and was acting aggressive. While he was yelling, she asked where do I live and if she can drive me home. I froze. At that moment, as much as I didn't want to be next to this weird man, I had no idea if it was any safer to get into someone's car. I politely said no, and they both followed me to my doorstep. I don't know if this is creepy enough, but to me, at that age, it was very stressful and scary. And I never knew the real intention of both of them.